Hi, good afternoon. So thanks for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, I'm working now for OpenShift, which is a very really interesting piece of software. And it has helped me learn a lot of things about the new technologies that are catching everybody's attention. And we'll be talking about one of them today, which is uh, Docker containers and how do you build them to run your Python applications in the cloud. So just a bit of explanation, what to expect for this talk. Uh, so the first part, I'll just give a bit, a bit of background on the technology side, uh, what, what the world looks like. So maybe that's the boring part, I would say. Uh, then next, I'm going to go hand, uh, hands on and show a bit how to create containers. That's probably one of the reasons you're here today. So who here wants to see how to create containers and never created containers before? OK, good. That's great. So next thing, I'll go a bit further from just creating the containers, but how do you actually wire things together? So one container is nice, but after some time, it gets really boring. So you probably want to do more things, like you want to run your application in a database or a message queue or some other thing. And I'm going to show you that. And, and then like we'll do a quick recap, see what, what we learned, and hopefully have some discussion in the questions part. So the background part, uh, what I've, I've been observing, like I'm not very old. I'm not in the industry since forever. But what I see is the tendency that everything that used to be manual, we are making it automatic. And this goes from the hardware side with uh, service provisioning. So we go from, OK, how do I get a new server? Before it was a manual process, you need to put a new box in a data center. And now you have virtual machines. You can simply start a new machine with whatever operating system you want in a matter of seconds or minutes, depends. Uh, we are also automating tests. So before development process was, OK, you, you spend a lot of time uh, working on something. Then you send the code over to somebody else. They will test it and put it in production. Right now, we try to automate it. and uh, So we have automated tests. So the same for deployments. Before, uh, deployment was, OK, how do I FTP my files to another server or in some other procedure? It was a risky thing. Not everybody is allowed to do that. You have a special team operation team to do it. And today we see movements like DevOps that try to bring together uh, developers and the operational team with whatever it means. It's a new buzzword and nobody knows what DevOps is, but that's what I take from it, is uh, making deployments quick, making communication better between operation team and developers. And another part that we also see automation is uh, with monitoring. So before you put your, your system online and you're hoping that it's still there, maybe you wait for a user to complain that your website is down. And now we have a lot of uh, services or tools that help you monitor your, your application live. So given this, what are, the, what are some of the techniques and practice that we have seen that uh, kind of make this new era that I, I have in mind. So on the more uh, developer side, we have uh, most processes for development include practices like sprints. So we have uh, iterative processes versus a long development process that, uh, you know, it takes forever for you to, to see what you're developing, to see what, what is the end result. So I think who here doesn't, who here is working? Actually, could you raise your hands? So most of us is working. Do you have a sprint at your work? OK, so maybe half and half. So that, that's what I've seen like in the companies I've worked uh, in the recent past. Uh, everybody's using some sort of uh, iterative process, be it Scrum or, or, or something else, or some in-house uh, crazy invented, uh, probably not a go horse development as Tatiana said. 
So we've also been doing automated tests. So as I said about automation, ideally we're not only having automated tests, we also have TDD, which is uh, test-driven development, which is you get to write your test first and this is part of designing your application. So Tatiana also mentioned that we'll be doing a coding dojo tomorrow for, for those of you interested in learning something new, in maybe learning Python hands-on or sharing your knowledge of Python hands-on. We'll have a coding dojo where you'll be able to participate and, and code together as a group. Uh, so other practice we've been doing is continuous integration, which is, okay, now you have a team of developers, everybody's making changes concurrently, you want to make sure that, given that automated test that helped single developer, uh, can we leverage that and make sure that our software is always in a, in a deliverable state? So that's, that's one of the aims of continuous integration. And the other one I would mention is continuous deployment. So not only, not only you have to make all of this automation around your, your software development, you want to make sure that you can deliver. That, that's the most important part, right? At, at any time, any point in time. So we see that a lot of uh, failures in development is due to you spend a lot of time, you did everything beautiful, and then it, it failed at the last moment. And if we really want to make sure that your project is, is su successful, you should strive to, to think about this deployment process in the very beginning. So the what we are going to see here, continuing with tools, is how how can we use the, the, the new technology to make uh, these processes, this uh, continuous delivery process, continuous integration, continuum, continuous deployment, how can we make this possible? So on one side, uh, here on the left side, we have the, the tools that are more connected with infrastructure. So we have tools like Ansible, uh, that can help you automate provisioning of machines. So who here has used or heard of Ansible? Okay, so it's a very popular tool. Uh, just doing a little merchandise. It was acquired by, by Red Hat recently. So that's something we use heavily internally and externally in our open source projects. Uh, there are tools like YUM and DNF, which helps you manage dependencies on your system. So you combine that with Ansible and it becomes easy to create a new virtual machine that has a certain state for running your application. And we've also seen the popularization of uh, infrastructure as a service. So now everybody's company is probably paying a bill for Amazon or some other provider, right? <laughs> so, and closer to the developer, we have tools like PIP uh, that helps us uh, install Python packages. So that's normally how most people manage their project level dependencies. And we have uh, also the proliferation of tools uh, in the area of platform as a service, where OpenShift is, is one of them. Uh, and of course, the new kid in town, which is the recent uh, thing, is Docker. So who here has tried Docker before? Also oh, everybody. So it's very popular. <laughs> and I took some quotes from, from their website for those that don't know what it is about. So just uh, go through it. So Docker is, uh, as it says, it is allow packaging applications with all the dependencies in a small unity. So you can think of it as a lightweight form of virtualization where before you would uh, you would create virtual machines to, to ship your application. Now you can create containers. So normally with virtual machines you don't uh, like you don't package the whole machine and then send it over to production. You normally have carefully crafted and maintained production machines or uh, test machines in, in other environments. And you use tools like Ansible to provision them to update the version of your of your software. But with Docker, it makes it very cheap to create and destroy these virtual pieces. So what, what it's really changing in terms of virtualization is that it's 
it's changing from uh, what we call pets and and cattle. So pets are are the the well, you take care of them, right? You don't simply go and kill your cat and get a new one. But with cattle, you don't care. You just if it's sick, you shoot it, and next day you have another one. Uh, so that's what we do with containers. Like we don't care about the life cycle of a container. It's meant to live and die. So the other quote from Docker is that uh, it's uh, wrapping up the file system and everything that it needs to run. So Docker is really about having all the, the data, the file system and some metadata to create a runtime for your application. So different than just packaging on the Python level, you get all the rest of the system together. So if you depend on system libraries and so on, you get to package everything. So your chance of failure in a deployment is, is lowered quite a bit. Okay, so let's go for the interesting part, which is creating containers. So how do I put my Python application in a container? So the first thing to understand is the difference between containers and images. So sometimes we talk about one and confuse with the other. So it's, it's good to have it clear. So uh, the container is a, is a sandbox environment where uh, that's running on the same kernel as the host. And it contains all the, all the pieces, as I said, all the pieces of a, of a system plus your application and some runtime metadata and it's isolated from the host where the image is actually a snapshot is the starting point of of the container so you what we'll be creating in reality is not really a container but we start by creating an image where we have all the system so the operating system the libraries we need to install your python application with its dependencies and some metadata to say how this thing is supposed to run, maybe environment variables and other things. And from that, we can create containers. Uh, so containers is not something really new, just to mention. It's something that is uh, a long time in the Linux kernel. But thanks to Docker, it became uh, really popular. And the cool thing about Docker is that it's a uh, sort of industry standard for the format of, of uh, images that we ship. So it, uh, it's good that if, if you create a Docker container, you know that there will be uh, an environment that you can run it. So it's, it's really good to have a standard. We have other competitors trying to, to, to come up, but we believe that having a, a single standard is, is important. So I'll show you now. It will be the, the, the first part of little demo. There will be a lot of little demos throughout. Uh, the presentation, and I will show you a little Python uh, web application, very small one file, and a Docker file, uh, which is how we are going to build this first image. So I'll switch now to switch now to show some code. I have some code here on GitHub if you want to try later uh, at home. <coughs> okay, yeah, okay. So I have to look back a bit, but so here is uh, uh, here is the mouse. So here is a little. So this is a Docker file. I'm gonna show you first the Python code. So here is a very very small Hello World application. It has eight lines. So I don't know if uh, you've used Bottle before. I picked it because it allows me to show a very concise example, where. I'm just saying, okay, there is one uh, u URL exposed, it's uh, the slash, and whenever you access it, it will show hello world, so it's, it's very, very simplistic. Uh -huh, so there will be some moving things to a different screen. Mm -hmm. So here's my terminal. So we've seen, uh, so we've seen the application, here's the same code. Maybe make it a bit bigger, visible. So we have here, we have the code. And okay, so how do we go and package it 
as a as a image right so the there are several ways I, I would just go with the better way which is you create a docker file which describes how the packaging is supposed to be done so there are a few elements here okay um, so is it better from the top so you can see and I'll make it even bigger to make sure everybody can see it. Okay, so gigantic. Uh, so the first line tells where you're starting uh, your your image. So you can start the image from scratch, of course. So you have an empty file system, and you can put everything there. So you're really going to put an operating system there. Uh, but for we don't want to reinvent the, the wheel all the time, so I'll start with uh, a Python image. So this Python image is the official uh, Python 3.5 image from from Docker, and it's a Ubuntu-based image plus an installation of Python 3.5. So this line, the first line here, is uh, making. So the first line here is basically like simplifying a lot of work, just saying, "Give me Python and an operating system." Then starts the the more uh, specific part for your application, which is we tell, in that case I have a web application, so I tell which port it's gonna use, and here we are using port 8080. Then uh, you see that you as a developer, you normally just install software in your system and you hope that, you know, it works, you hope that for other people it's also gonna work the same, they will go and install things and uh, so here we need to be more uh, methodic and we have to say okay this is how I install things in that specific system so for for the this case since we already have Python we don't have any other dependency I don't really need to install other pieces but imagine I want to install uh, some some library, like imagine I, I have a website that creates thumbnails, I need to install image magic. I would go in this case and run apt get install uh, image magic and, and all the dependencies. So for us, it's simple. We just need to run a command, we'll create a directory. And here we have a little line to update pip itself. And I will set what would be the working directory. So this is part of that metadata I was talking about. So when you start a container with this image, the current working directory will be user source app. Then this is important. We are saying copy all the source code uh, into this directory, user source app. So the dot here means the, the context of the, the build that we're going to do. And it's essentially right now the current directory. So it includes the Docker file itself, the app.py file, the, our Python script, and the requirements.txt file, which I actually forgot to show. Uh, and then the next step, we will install the dependencies using pip. And notice that possibly that's not what you do in your uh, development environment. You don't you don't really care about writing this no cache dir and other things that we probably just use the requirements file so when we are writing this uh, image we want to make it sure make sure that it's as small as possible so we are trying to clear caches and or even avoid caches at all costs and then the last part here is uh, it's telling what command to run when you start your container so in this case, we run Python 3 with our script. So it's a rather short uh, file, but still like it's very dense. There are a lot of concepts there that you, you need to master. There are syntaxes for defining certain commands and so on. Right. I, I won't go into like detail of a Docker file tutorial. I think that's enough for us to know. Uh, and I'll show just because I forgot before, I'll show you the requirements file. This is a very simple project. We are only using bottle. That's what we need to install with pip. Okay, so how do I build 
this right, how do I create my image so given that you have a docker file describes all the steps how to create your image you just use the docker tool to say docker build give it a name hello and give the the context which is the current directory so we do run I had everything cached hopefully so I didn't have to pray for the demo gods uh, and then we have a new image called hello so if we if we will we can can list all the images and I have here my hello image now so as you can see there it was just built my hello image I have two images there I'll show you why okay so that's one way to build images Let's go back to, if I can find the cursor. So what did you think? Was it simple? Was it complicated? I think it looks simple until you start doing it. So for those that started using Docker, you probably realize that there are a lot of pitfalls and some small details that uh, you get to learn as you try it. So I'll go through a few image cons a few considerations you, you have to have in mind when you're creating your own Docker images if you decide to do so. So the first thing is what is going to be your base image. So it's easy to pick an image from Docker Hub, which is a it's like a is a website where you have a repository of other users' images, include some official images provided by Docker. So you have to pick one of those or start from scratch. So that decision is going to influence uh, how your container runs. It's just like how you choose your operating system for your development of a production environment. So the next thing that uh, trip people up and and you may you may learn about it maybe a bit too late is about the proper usage of layers. So the way that Docker works every action that you do, like every instruction you run, it becomes a new layer. So the file system is not the normal file system you're used to, where you have all your data and that's it. You have a layered file system. So everything is, uh, is made by layers. So you have, a, you have a base layer. When you do something else, it doesn't change the previous layer. That layer was, is immutable. You just overlay it with a new layer with the changes. So if you're not careful enough, and for example, you add a lot of software in one layer, and then you remove it in the next layer, your final image size is actually like the same as before or, or bigger than before. So a lot of people are wondering like, oh, why my image is so big? You have to be careful about usage of layers. The next thing that people maybe don't talk enough about is about uh, the default user and permissions. So as you saw in that example there, I didn't mention anything about user. And the, the official image of Python 3.5 will just uh, give you the root users uh, as a default. So what it means in practice is that if there will be ever uh, a security issue with Docker that allows you to, to take control of the container and, and to escape the containment, uh, y you basically have root access in the host. So this is a serious danger and people normally overlook it. They think, okay, the container is meant to contain, but unfortunately that's not true. So one thing you should have in mind is what's gonna be your, def your default user. Normally you should have a user with uh, non root privileges as the default. So you also think about exposed ports as we saw. You think about what is the work directory that these are maybe things that you could overlook in the beginning, but they make uh, using the image uh, either convenient or inconvenient if you made the bad choices. And we saw uh, we set the the command to be executed when we started the the container. Uh, so that that's 
that choice also of entry point and command is something that I see a lot of people confusing in the, in the Docker community. They use the wrong syntax and they don't use these things properly. So it's important to go read the docs, understand how it works. Uh, then you also need to think how you install dependencies. So depending on your base image on your system, there will be different ways to install system dependencies, language dependencies, and how do you do, how do you reuse parts of the image? So it's thinking about all of these things that uh, part of the, the development of OpenShift include a project called source to image. So we thought that all of these hard decisions you have to make to, to create an image, maybe you don't really want to be making them over and over again. So that's, that's where the reuse comes in, right? So if you know how to do it well once, why can't you just reuse that? So I'm going to show you again like how to do another build, but this time using this uh, source to image tool. So it's going to look a lot similar to, to the Docker approach, but we'll see the, the differences. So let's try to switch again to... my terminal okay okay so this is the this is the line make it bigger Boom. bigger good enough okay so I'll just run it so in installing bottle installing our dependencies and we're done so it works pretty much as the this script we ran before we saw here we have the images again that we built first one was the the one using docker the other one using our s2i2 so And then you'll be wondering, okay, so why would I, why there are like two tools that do the same thing? So they don't quite do the same thing, right? If we go back to, to the considerations we, we talked before, right? So I'll try to show a, a little bit of, okay, so I'll try to show you a little bit, for example, if we look at the layers of this this image, we saw that it's already a smaller image at 500 something megabytes. It has this base CentOS, and all of the code that you that that we have in the application, it goes as a single layer on top of that. So we have some base layers, and then we have all all of the source code goes as a single layer. When you do a normal Docker build every step of the docker file that you had becomes a new layer so this is a bit a bit worse right so the other thing is that imagine like all all the time you have to you have to create a python application you have to write a file like this and make decisions about how to install things what things need to change and so on so when you use uh, the source to image tool we just said okay there is a there's a there's some common uh, there are some common things that you need when you're writing a Python application. So as you saw, there was no there was no Docker file when I did this when I did S two I build. There is no Docker file involved. We just care about the source code, right? So how do we take source code? We know it's a Python project, so probably you want to have 
Python, minimal Python environment styled. So you get that. Uh, you want to have some core uh, system dependencies installed. You also get that. And you get a procedure how to install your particular piece of software, and which is uh, through uh, the assemble script. So maybe I should show you how this is actually working. So you see that the key thing here that avoid the, that don't don't need the Docker file is that we are ref referencing what is a builder image. So we have something that's called Python 3.4 CentOS 7. So this Docker image here knows how to create other images. So it means that as a community, we create one Python image. And now every time you have a Python project, you can just reuse that to install and run your, your code. If you have a particular, for example, a security issue that is discovered, one person discovers it, we can update the, the image, you run a build again, and you have a clean patched container. So I'll try to switch to browser show. Okay. So I'll open here the this is the project where uh that's the, the Python three four image for source to image that allows you to just give the source and then we have a Python image for you. So the interesting thing here is that there are three scripts. So the bottom one here, usage, is it is just when you run the image, if you didn't if you run that uh Python three four image without any code on it, without your custom code, it will just run this by default telling you how to use the image. So that's the purpose of the use it script. Then you have a run script, which tells you how to execute your, your code in runtime. So again, that in Docker, you have to create one instruction that tells how to start the application. Here you have, uh, here you have like a common code for most applications. How do you, inst how do you run a uh, web service? Uh, for example, a Django application or an application running with Gunicorn. And as we support more and more tools, we can uh, update that script. And we have the assemble script, which is the one running pip, and also lets you uh, install custom packages and system level things. So all of these all of these scripts you can customize in your in your code by adding uh, a script that replaces this or adds on top of this. So you using this tool, you you can create better, easier images. But again, we are still doing things manually, right? So when I said in the beginning about automation. So of course, you're not supposed to be like doing Docker builds by hand or doing source to image builds by hand, but you want to automate this. And if you're using OpenShift, we have a concept of builds that support both building regular Docker files and also building, uh, using the source to image tool, building your code straight. So you just provide your source repository, we'll build an image for you. Uh, so I think that that's the cool thing in terms of automation. So there are a couple more things to show and not a lot of time. So We'll show you now how to wire things together, right? So I showed you one uh, hello world application. I, we didn't see the application running. I have it here. Uh, the running is really boring. You just show hello, right? So not, not, not very interesting. So I wrote in the same repository here, uh, I wrote some other two applications. One called pools. This is using requests to call the GitHub API and get recent pull requests from from the OpenShift origin project, which is where we develop OpenShift. And 
There's another one called Frontend, which is also a bot application, but this time it uses the pools, the pools application and renders a template, which we see here. And it's just HTML code. So this is consuming. So I just wrote these two small applications quickly just to show. Haha, I cannot scroll. OK, yeah, it's just this. Just to show how one service can consume, uh, uh, so how, how two services can interact together. Right? So if you have at work maybe a microservice architecture, or you certainly have at least an application and a database that you're going to run as separate containers, so how can they talk to each other? Since we are short on time, I'll show you uh, the, the console here for this is the, this is the OpenShift console with some gigantic zoom. Uh, so I, I, had a, I had one for a live demo. Since it might take some time, I have another one with uh, an already deployed application. So here I have the front-end application and the pools application. And now I did to create that. So this I can show and we will wait while it happens. So there is a command from OpenShift called OC. OC is the OpenShift client. You say OC new app. Again, I'm using the, the Python 3.4 image. And I pass, as you can see there, the URL for my code. And I, I'm just giving it a name. Like the default name would be ugly. I want to call it frontend. <coughs> and with that one line, it will go fetch my code in GitHub. It, would it, it will create, a, create and build an image for me and you deploy this image creating a container so this one is the one that is already running you can see what it does if I find the tab here so this is I can refresh yeah so these are the three recent pull requests in the project for the quick demo so I'll go back and take the one the, in the live demo so we see that it's creating a build for 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 the front end application. And as soon as the image is built, it will run the image as a container. And the fun thing is that if I have two of them, one can consume the other. In this case, by uh so here is the pools. I uh, see that the only thing that changed I'm I'm changing now for pools. So we'll have the build of both. And for this particular application, uh, here, right? So for this app, the the front end app show you the code again it checks the environment variable for a pools service host so when you run multiple applications every container has access to the other for the, for the ip and port of other services as environment variables so you can use that to connect the pieces together or you can use uh you can also use DNS. So there is a build team DNS in OpenShift that you can query uh, by name. So for example, if you query pools and you are in the same project, you can access the service called pools from the front end. And let's see how far we went here. So now we have a build running for both. So the, uh, the connectivity here is slow. So it's actually downloading things from internet. Yeah, I see that the front end finished and it's gonna scale pod for one. So it's very easy, I can click a button and I can get two copies of it. So there are a lot of automation here. So I think that's the kind of thing that we as developers should enjoy in the current days and not uh, thinking about manually doing stuff. Okay, so that was wiring it all together. We saw how to use new app for doing that. Uh, so there's another thing, if we have 
one minute left, but I'll just show you that the other way to combine things is uh, using uh, templates. So if you have more complex applications with multiple components, I will show you one here. This is one example of template. It's just JSON. And this defines like containers and uh, which ports things run, environment variables. We don't have time to go into detail. Like if you're interested, you can reach me on the corridors and I can show you this in more detail. But the idea is that you can define all the pieces of your of your project, of your of your product, if it's composed by multiple pieces. You can define them together in one place and with using your new app again, you just instantiate this template. Uh, so again, if you want more information, you can, can talk about it after. Okay, so recapping, we saw at least two ways to, or three ways to build, uh, to build Docker images and Docker containers. So the first one was using the Docker tool. Then we saw a lot of things, a lot of uh, concerns that we have to have in mind when we're doing that. We saw a tool that help us go from source code to running images that's the source to image tool. And then we saw how to do that with an automated environment, which is inside OpenShift. Okay, I think with that, we'll go for questions. Let's Thank go. you. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, the question that received mo most votes is, uh, does it make sense to use vir virtual environment inside Docker? Okay, that, that's a good question. So the answer short is yes, it does. Uh, so if you go a bit further to think, so the way, if, if you don't use a virtual wave, it normally implies that you have access to the system. So I if you're running just pip install something without a virtual wave, you need root, right? So you need sudo pip something. And as I said, that's not a very good idea. So you wanna run your image as an unprivileged user. So you can still use pip from the system if you do a, a, a user site install. So it's, I think, pip dash dash user. But then again, there are other concerns, like if you're using the, the system, you get, uh, you probably get some libraries installed, like depending on what packages you have installed on your system, you get like Jinja. Uh, for example, DNF is written in Python, so it already comes with, with some dependencies of itself. And this might conflict with things you have in your own application. So it, it's, it's still good practice to have virtual wave, have only your, your project dependencies at the certain versions installed and isolated. Yep. Um, so you said uh, Python 3.5 is uh, official Python, Python image. So was it already packaged by Python people or doc Docker people or some random uh -huh. person? or uh, and who will take care of, of the upgrade? So the official images from Docker are maintained by Docker people. So they are Docker developers. So they are not official from Python, but official from Docker. Mm -hmm. uh, we, so we have equally, the, the, the images we ship with OpenShift are maintained by, by Red Hat. Good. And uh, what is uh, the biggest business advantage uh, of using Docker? Mm -hmm, that's uh, another good question. Is I think there are many advantages. So maybe the silly one is to say that you're, you're following the trends. <laughs> but so I, I, I really like the, the, the one thing I mentioned about pets versus cattle. That with, a, with a container, it's very cheap to, to try things out. So for us developers, it's easy to, to try tools. It's easy uh, to try new versions. Like I can try my project with uh, with different versions of Python, and it doesn't cost me uh, much. It doesn't take me time like trying to manage different versions of Python two and three in the same machine. I can just spawn a container and then delete it. Uh, and for for uh, production for deployment, it's also good that you have everything uh, packaged in a concise and reproducible uh, shape that you know that if it runs. Uh, if it runs hi here, it's also going to run there in the same way. Okay. 
Uh, could you tell us what is uh, special about OpenShift compared to other similar tools? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's also something I've been learning. So before I joined OpenShift, I tried to look at the market and see other platforms as a service. And a lot of them, they're really easy to get started. Uh, but then that's about it. Like they might have a nice UI and so on. But then when you go to see the, 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 the fundamental parts, they are, they normally, they are lacking, they are lacking things. So for example, there are, there are some uh, tools that are solely based on Docker. It also means they can only run in one node. So as soon as you try to scale and have multiple nodes, forget about that too. Uh, with OpenShift, we are founded not only on Docker, but the other important piece is Kubernetes, uh, which is a project from Google for container scheduling. Uh, and like Red Hat works, like we developers, we work on the upstream projects, both in Docker and Kubernetes. And so this solves the problem of scaling to multiple nodes. It solves other problems that tools like uh, Docker Swarm and Docker Compose don't solve. And yeah, there are numerous things that uh, I don't know how long time we have for me to go describing them. So yeah, maybe we can talk about it later or you can look at uh, the OpenShift website for all the reasons why it's great. Mm -hmm. and, and it's open source. Okay, two, two last questions. Mm -hmm. um, are there any practical differences between Docker and the other containerization technologies like OpenVZ? Uh, or is it just about the cool factor you mentioned already? Okay, so, well, as far as I learned by listening to other people's talks, <laughs> I think down the, the, the system level, it's all the same thing. So the difference is how easy it is to set up, how easy it is to use. Of course, there are some, uh, there will be differences, but uh, for me, the cool thing about Docker is not, uh, is not, you know, there's the hype, but also that it's setting a standard. So now everybody talks about containers, we talk about <coughs> Docker. Uh, it, it would be different if there would be, okay, because there was already containers before, but nobody was talking about it. So I think that that's, that's the, like Docker's mission for me in, in in the current world is to set the standard. And the last one. So what about security? If you're using image from uh, Docker Hub, you can be sure about it. It's, uh, is it then good for production usage? Well, yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. As I said, there's this problem of running things as root, among other things. So again, it, it, it depends on your requirements, your concerns.